but to be holy means different let me tell you something that the word kadosh means set apart for a purpose but now the root let me tell you the root of the word kadosh is the following word it means other let's get started on today's message all right I'm excited about this one because it's something that I believe is, is necessary for me to do if we're about to move or progress any further. I'm going to say it again. I feel this message is necessary before we progress any more in what God wants to do in this church or in this ministry. You are here in this season for a reason. It's not by accident, not by force. You are here for a reason. And what we're about to enter into I believe this message is necessary for your life. If you want to put a title to today's message, it is going to be called a holy generation. A holy generation. Even in the Bible, we see examples where Joshua is about to go and do something. Joshua is about to conquer the land, conquer the promised land. But before that, God asks of something. And he says, I want you to consecrate my people first. Because where we're going, it will require a holy generation. And I believe that everyone here in this place is going to be a part of that holy generation. And you might be looking at yourself right now and saying, but hold up, I'm not holy, Pastor. I've tried to be holy. And I don't, maybe I don't even know what that means. That just sounds like, you know, religious vernacular. I don't even know the meaning of that word. But let me tell you that God is going to use you in holiness. The blood of Jesus Christ has already accomplished that in your life. You are redeemed. You are holy. But now there is something. We need to understand what holiness means according to the Bible. Let me tell you that holiness according to the Bible and also in terms of the definition of what Hebrews, or sorry, of, of what the Jewish culture meant for that word to mean is the following. The Hebrew word for holy is the word kadosh. This word kadosh has an important meaning and it does not mean what we think holiness means. We look at each other and say holiness means completely perfect, without sin. You are a, just a good overall person, a good overall Christian, and you are holy. But according to scripture, according to Jewish culture, the word kadosh means to be set apart. Let me tell you that when the Bible, when God will look onto his people, God would confess and say, this is a holy nation. My God's not a liar. Because I, I, I very well know that when we look at the people of Israel, they weren't perfect, or were they? They weren't perfect. They weren't sinless. And yet God would confess over them, this is a holy nation. And what he meant by that was this, that this is a nation that is set apart, not to be like everybody else. You need to understand that. You did not come to church to be like everybody else. You've come to a place that will be unique and might ask of us to resist criticisms, to resist arguments against us, to have contrary spirits. Let me tell you something that in this season, like never before, I've been accused from different angles in my life. But I've decided I want to preach the truth of God no matter what the criticisms are. And I want to tell you that, man, the, the attacks have come from different places. I was even called someone who has an antichrist spirit. Can you imagine that? But I don't care anymore. God is preparing us to be a holy generation. Regardless of what people say about you, you are set apart for the purposes of God. You are set apart. Start to get rid of that addiction of, I want to be complimented. I want the accolades. If you want the accolades, then you won't be a holy nation. If you want the praises of people, you're not going to be able to be a holy nation. But to be holy means different. Let me tell you something that the word kadosh means set apart for a purpose. But now the root, 
Let me tell you, the root of the word kadosh is the following word. It means other. Let me say that again. Kadosh means to be set apart for a purpose. But also kadosh, the root word of kadosh means other. Say other with me. Other. What do you mean by other? It means that there is one thing, but when someone looks at it, they say, oh, but they're from the other category. <laughs> See, you are in this world, but you are not of it. Other. I'm part of the other class. I'm, I'm not of this world. God has called me to be a holy generation, set apart, different. Maybe it might seem crazy to others, but I'm supposed to be classified as other. What denomination are you part of? Other. I'm the denomination of the Holy Spirit with power and glory. Come on, somebody. It's, part, it's time to be set apart as other. Don't be afraid. Nation, you're going to fill out a form nowadays and begin to say, nationality, yeah, I'm other. <laughs> That's what I am. Other. What languages do you speak? Well, English, Spanish, and other because I speak in tongues. You're part of the other category. Come on, somebody. God is calling you to be a little bit different. And it's okay because God wants to show that it's possible even with the foolishness of man that God can be glorified. Whew. Let me tell you something that God is calling us to be of that other, a little different, unique. Man, if the world zigs, you zag. If the world does one thing, then and you have to do something else. That is okay. But here's the thing. We must become a holy nation. I want you to just extend your hands right now. I want to be a holy nation. Yes. That is something powerful that you are asking right now. To be part of the, to be a holy person means now you're going to be set apart from the normalcy of life. Are you ready for that? To be set apart from the normalcy of life. Can I tell you something? That in your inheritance, there is nothing normal that is in it. When Jesus died on the cross and he gave us the inheritance of heaven, he did not say my people will be average, normal, in the background. No, that is not part of your inheritance. Your inheritance, there is nothing natural about it. It is supernatural. Your inheritance has the power of God, the spirit of God. Your inheritance has something more. You are, haven't come to church to be in the normalcy of life. The spirit of God is not normal. It is supernatural. It is something else, something different. Outside of the average. Somebody say amen. You got to understand what I'm saying. I pray that you're understanding what I'm saying today. To be set apart. To be of the other. To be different. It might make you look strange, but that's okay. It might make you do things that maybe people don't agree with, but that's okay. I want to read some scripture to you of what God was telling me. I want to tell you that. Before, before I read this passage, it's going to be in Leviticus 8.22. I'm going to go read it to verse 24. But I want to tell you that my wife not even knowing what I was going to preach about. Yesterday we went to eat dinner and something strange happened. Like I said, other. It's going to be out of the normal. But anyways, I was, I was eating dinner. My wife looked at my, my ears and she's like, wait, what's going on? Your, your ear is like so red right now. And I'm like, wait, hold up. God healed me of all allergies, so it can't be allergies. I don't know what's going on, but my ears were so red. And she was just looking, and, I, and I'm like, which ear? And she's like, it's the right ear that is red. And I was like, okay, that's, that's, that's strange because what I'm about to preach on today has a little bit to do with placing blood on our ears. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It was a confirmation of what God was saying to me. That he's about to do something with your ear. Woo. Leviticus 8.22. Are you ready for this? Woo. Okay. In Leviticus 8.22 it says, He then presented the other ram. The ram for the ordination. And Aaron and his sons laid their hands on its head. 
Moses slaughtered the ram and took some of its blood. And watch this. And put it on the lobe of Aaron's which ear? Right ear. And on the thumb of his right hand. And on the big toe of his right foot. And then Moses also brought Aaron's sons forward and put some of the blood on the lobes of their right ears, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of their right feet. Then he splashed blood against the sides of the altar. We'll leave it right there. Can I tell you this? That in that moment, God was instructing Moses. And he was saying, Moses, I want you to consecrate my priests. Because they're going to do things that are out of the ordinary. They're going to be part of the other class. The Levites aren't to be part of the normal tribes. The Levites are supposed to be of the other category. And so... Moses then says, okay, God, how do I consecrate them? Well, God makes them do something strange. He gets a, a ram, and then they, every, he tells everyone, hey, gather around. They place their, head, their hands on the head of the ram, and God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to slaughter this, this, this ram. I want you to, to kill it. And let me tell you this, that it might sound strange. Like, why would God ask of this Scene. Imagine nowadays we were to do that. You know, I would call a, a, a ram and, and let's just, you know, slaughter everyone's hands, be upon it. We would be like, well, that sounds strange. That looks strange. You know, first of all, you would call animal services. What are they doing to animals? But they, they put their hands on this ram and when they slaughtered it, God was trying to show them something. That your sin has a consequence. And in order for your sins to be forgiven, this would need to happen. And unless we get that prophetic picture, we won't have a hunger for holiness. You, if you understand what your holiness cost, there would be a desire for you to want to be holy. If you understood, see, nowadays we talk about grace, but do you understand that your grace was not free for somebody it was free for you to receive but it wasn't free for God he paid the price of his only begotten son to be slaughtered to be, die on our behalf to die on the cross on our behalf so that we may have our holiness and he needed them to see that picture okay whoa what I did has a consequence what I do means something so he slaughtered the ram, and then God said, now I want you to do something with the blood of this ram. This is what I want you to do. I want you to then get a bit of that blood and begin to smudge it on the ears, on the right ear of the priest. I want to start with this. Why the right ear? Well, let's go into the logical side of things. Let's just speak a little bit on the practical side, why the right ear. Well, if, if, you, if you look it up, even on Google, you will see that there is a purpose to your right ear. Your right ear is what is dominant for speech, logic, speech and logic and obedience. I don't know about you, but sometimes when, when someone says something, you're like, huh? You automatically like turn to your right ear, even if you don't know it. It's because your, your right ear is the one that understands speech. What do you say? What? It's your right ear automatically because it's your right ear. Your left ear is more for the creativity and all of that. But anyways, why the right ear? Because God wants to make sure that there is a generation willing to hear him speak. Uh, waiting to listen to his words to be obedient to it. He is trying to sanctify your ear. You know what that means? That means your ear to be set apart. He doesn't want your ear to be listening to whatever. But to be hearing his voice, to be hearing his words, his direction, his guidance. So let me tell you this, you have, must have to lend your ear only to the things of God. What else does this mean? This also means willing to say yes to God's word. What I'm about to say may be something that, um, that we need to understand, especially for these days that we are living in. Okay, I want us to go to 2 Timothy 4.3. We're still talking about the ear right now. My ear's burning as we speak right now. I don't know. <laughs> 2 Timothy 4.3. I, I, I want you to see this. 
It says, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Now the next verse, watch this in verse 4. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Can I tell you what the danger of the end times will be is when people flock around entertainment. And I'm glad that while we were worshiping, that was something that was said. Because the flock, the many, all the people will gather around the teachers that are entertaining. But those preaching the sound doctrine, I I don't want to be a part of that. Because now they're no longer mainstream. Now they're part of the other. The sound doctrine is part of the other now. Those speaking things that are biblical, that's of the other. Tell me a joke, pastor. Pat me on the back and tell me everything is okay. And let me leave on Sunday uplifted. And that's it. But let me tell you that you need to hear sound doctrine, especially in these end times. It is important to hear sound doctrine. Why is that? Because only sound doctrine can bring transformation into your life. The truth will set you free. It is the word of God that changes, that transforms. It's the only thing that can shake us up. And why don't we like sound doctrine? Let me tell you this. The reason why we don't like sound doctrine is this. Because sound doctrine might offend sometimes. Sound doctrine might not sound good sometimes. Sound doctrine might not sound like something that everybody would applaud to. Sometimes sound doctrine will take people throwing stones at you like they did to Jesus. Spitting on you like they did to Jesus. Sometimes it requires when you're preaching the truth to have many people against you. Do you still want to be holy? Get used to it. And let me tell you something. Get used to it. Because those who are of the other, the set apart, will be people who might might be stoned. But let me tell you this. We need to be people who have our ears inclined to want to hear sound doctrine. I don't know why, but I'm feeling this in my spirit right now. That I don't know, but today the Lord, even through this preaching, is right now anointing your ear. He is smudging the blood of Jesus on your ear. So much so, listen to me carefully, whether you stay in this church or not, from this day and on, your ear is now set apart. You will not be okay with entertaining speeches anymore. You will be hungry for the word of God. Done with the people speaking things with the intention of entertainment. I am done with that. I want the truth. I want the power of God. I want demonstration. I want to see the Holy Spirit move in our lives. I'm here for the other. Time to believe the truth of God because only his truth can set you free. I was having a conversation with one of my disciples and we were saying that it's time to read the Bible again and just believe it for what it is. It's time to just just open it up. And I'm I'm, I'm being honest right now. I want to get rid of my Bible theology degree. I just want to read the Bible again just to believe it for what it says. I am so hungry for the truth of the word of God. Stop questioning it. If it says, yes, that the church can pray and heal the sick, why do you add unnecessary theology to it? I was talking to someone, and it it, it aggravated my spirit. I was talking to someone because, you know, I I, I placed a post uh, where we saw a miracle happen on the street. That there was someone who was healed from sciatica. Glory to God and all praise to him because it wasn't myself. But there was someone who began to attack and began to say to me, oh, so now you're a healer? You have the gift of healing? I responded saying, I claim to have nothing. I'm just obedient to the word of God. You can say whatever you want, but I just believe. I believe the word of God to be true. Why are you so focused on the theology? Is it the gift of healing? Is it this? Or is it the anointing? Focus on the fact that someone got healed. Come on, somebody. It's time to believe what the word of God says. If you're going to memorize a Bible verse, I love Romans 3, 4, which says, let God be true and let man be a liar. Let me say that again. In Romans 3, 4, it says, let God be true and man be a liar. You know why I'm saying that? Because 
It is time for us to begin to recognize that if it's not scripture, if the Bible isn't saying it, man is a liar and God is true. Whew. But, I mean, where, where do you get that pastor from? Where does it say that you can pray for the sick people and they will be healed? Well, doesn't it say that in James 5.15? It says that the prayer offered in faith will make the sick well. And if you hear someone preaching against healing, you tell them, let God be true and let man be a liar. What about deliverance? What about speaking in tongues? That's not for today. Well, my Bible says something different. It says in Mark 16, and these signs shall follow those who believe. They shall cast out demons in my name and they will speak in new tongues. Let God be true and let man be a liar. But this generation is supposed to prophesy. Prophecy ceased. Let me tell you, that's the lie of a devil. In Joel 2.32, what does it say? It says that, the, that there will be an outpour of the Spirit of God. And then your sons and daughters, they shall prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. My Bible says I can prophesy. So let God be true and man be a liar. What doctrines of man have you been believing these days? Because my word says I can pray for the sick. My word says that I can ask for any gift of the Holy Spirit. Prove it. Where the Apostle Paul says eagerly desire all the gifts. Show me a Bible verse that tells me that I cannot desire the, spirit, the, the gifts of the Spirit of God. Show me a Bible verse that says we shouldn't be moving in deliverance. But let me tell you. Let God be true. Let his word be true. And let man be a liar. It's time for you to be hungry for the truth of the word of God. And just read it for what it is. And believe it. Don't question it. You know, I, I want to tell you, the, the Bible here is talking about the itching ear syndrome. That we have itchy ears. That what we want is to hear somebody that speaks to our inexperience. Let me tell you that when I became a, a Christian for real in my life, I was born in a Christian family. But when I gave my life to Christ for real, I remember I would read the book of Acts. I would read it and I would say, whoa, it shows here that if we are baptized in the spirit of God, that we can speak in tongues. I began to read that there were healings happening. I began to read different things. And I would say, God, I want it. And maybe like some of you guys, maybe you are privileged that you came to this church and immediately you began to see the supernatural happen in your life. There are people here who in one month of being in this church, they already saw the power of God move in their life. Glory to God. But I had a different experience, unfortunately. I was believing, but I didn't see some things in my life. And guess what? I had the temptation of going to YouTube to hear because my itchy ears needed to justify my lack of experience. So I began to look for people with the doctrines of cessationism. Began to look and hear people that say, yeah, it's okay. You know, the, the speaking in tongues is, is, isn't for today. You know, prophecy isn't for today. And my itchy ears were addicted to that because it would explain a lot to my lack of inexperience. But let me tell you something that I had to repent in my heart and I began to confess and say until, you know, even if I read this and if I don't see it in my life, I will continue to persevere in it until I see it happen in my life. And can I tell you the first time that I spoke in tongues was not maybe in an altar call. It was actually on my own just in my room and just saying, God, your word says it. I believe it. I haven't experienced it yet. But I say yes to it because it's in your word. And I just began to sebrekanda brashe. I began to just speak in tongues. And it was a beautiful experience that I had. But let me tell you this. That there was a season where I wasn't. I wasn't feeling anything. I was praying but maybe I didn't see. Maybe right now you've come to church. And you haven't experienced the healing yet. And maybe you're tempted to want to go to a type of church that says, yeah, healings don't happen today. But I'm telling you now. It's not in vain to persevere in the truths of God. Continue. If the word of God says it, believe it till your last breath. Persevere in it. Continue to confess it. Continue to say it until you see it happen in your life. I need to hear someone say amen to that. 
believe the promises of God of what it says about you we need to go like children again in the kingdom of God and just say God I, I, I want to believe again because unfortunately we have a lot of unbelieving believers today we believe one thing but don't believe the other things that the Bible says can I tell you something that you cannot eradicate the supernatural power of God from the life of Jesus or his ministry you cannot you cannot eradicate you cannot remove it from his life let me tell you something because a lot of people believe in salvation but to believe you are saved automatically you believe in the supernatural what do you mean well to believe that someone died and rose from the dead that's not natural so at the foundation of your faith you need to believe in the power of God it's impossible you, you cannot believe in Jesus without believing in the power of God because it is his power it is his spirit that made him come back to life are you hearing yeah are you receiving this so the, the, I need to believe what the Bible says and I need to believe it until my experiences change. Continue, continue, continue to read the word of God. If it says that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues, even if you don't experience it yet, continue confessing it until you see it come to life in you. Persevere in the truths of God. Whew. Wow. Like I said, my, my ears are hot right now. I don't know about you. Whew. Let me tell you this. That also, the Bible is not void of power. It's not an empty book. And if you've chosen to trust in that word of God, it, you will see power be released from it. It is not an empty book. It's not a, it, it's not a textbook. It is not a narrative. It's not just beautiful stories. The word of God has power. And the word of God, this is one of the, the definitions of the word of God. There's also a word called rema. Say rema with me. The Rema word is a word that goes from theology to then manifesting in your life. A now word. So we need to transfer through the faith of God to believe in the word of God and say Rema. From story to my story. From what they experienced to what I experience. What they did to now I do it as well. That is the pattern of what the scripture is asking of us to do. Jesus said it, you shall do greater things, greater works than I did. So believe in that. I'm going to trust Jesus before I believe in men that try to misinterpret it and say, no, that's not what it means. No. Let God be true and what? And man be a liar. How many men have been lying nowadays? Read the word of God and begin to believe it for what it says. There's something else that is symbolic about the ear. Let me tell you this. In the Old Testament, uh, they, they still had uh, bond servants or slaves. And the Bible says that in the people, within the community of the Jewish people, that every seventh year, so meaning that if you had a slave, you could only own him for six years. But on the seventh year... He would be set free. Completely, no more obligation to stay. But the Bible says, and he instructs Moses, and he says, if this slave loves his master and doesn't want to leave, then what we will do is present them to the judge, and then we will place his ear on the doorpost, and then you will pierce it. And now that piercing in his ear will symbolize that I belong to another. I belong to my master. Prophetically, what this means is that when you give your ear to God, you are saying, God, I want to be your bond servant, serving you. I want to be faithful and loyal to you as my master. Because a lot of us call Jesus Lord. But do you know what Lord means or where that terminology even comes from? Lord means owner. I thought he was just my buddy and my friend. Jesus is my friend. He's your Lord. And Jesus says that many will come and say, Lord, Lord, but I will say, I did not know you. Can I tell you this? 
that this is why I'm saying it's important right now to become a holy generation. Because it is the holy generation that understands if I am set apart and I'm not supposed to be like everybody else. That I'm not supposed to look like darkness but to look like light. To be of the other. I need to be willing to say Jesus is my Lord. My Savior, my Lord, my Master. Whom I will obey and trust. Can I tell you this? The next step is this. Man, I can spend man, a lot of time in each of these. I've I just barely just gone through the ear part. But let's talk a little bit about the thumb. I just have very little time. But let me tell you this. That then after the ear, he grabbed some blood. And then he rubbed it on the thumb, the right thumb of the priest. And there was something symbolic about that as well. See, your right thumb, first of all, the right hand means power, means strength. That's what, what symbolically it means. But why the thumb? Can I tell you that your fist has no strength until your thumb grabs onto it. You cannot do spiritual warfare without being set apart. Because if you do spiritual warfare without the holiness, there, if demons look at you and say, you don't even... Believe and obey your own God. Why should I obey you? This is what gives us strength. Because Jesus says, in my name you will cast out demons. The authority comes from understanding that I am set apart for Jesus. It's important. I cannot fight in the spiritual realm without first getting and understanding that I need to be set apart. How can I set, how can I... Set someone free from darkness if I'm still chilling in it. I need to be set apart, come into the light so I can expose the light into my friends. I'm speaking to somebody today. So your thumb represents also your daily activities. It's about the works you do. It's about serving the Lord, saying yes to God. But there is something else about your thumb. is that your thumb also symbolizes what you can grab onto. Without your thumb, it's going to be hard to grab onto something. But with your thumb, you can hold onto things. What God is trying to say is this. First, set your thumb free and let go of things I told you not to hold on to. If I didn't command you to hold on to it, let it go so you can have a free hand to hold on to me. And let me tell you, it's time to hold on to the things of God. Come on, somebody. Let me give you... Let me, let me tell you this, in James 1.23, for those who, who want a little bit of Bible verse for this. James 1.23, it says, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they think, do. Today we have too many messages of you just got to think about it. Grace just makes you be. But James says it's about doing. Devil ain't happy. I'm telling you, the devil ain't happy today. James 2.21, I'm going to keep on preaching. James 2.21, look at this. It says, James goes further to say, uh, uh, James 2.21. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and what? And his actions we're working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. A holy generation is not satisfied by just having the faith that believes but also having the faith that does. James is arguing here. He says faith without works is dead. See, in other words, your faith is complete the moment it begins to manifest what it believes. 
<laughs> I'm going to say that again. See, your faith is complete until it manifests what it believes. If you are someone saying, I believe that people can be healed through prayer. You believe it, but do you do it? Your faith isn't complete. I believe in tithing, but you don't do it. You have the half faith, but not the due part of the faith. And the Bible is saying here that faith and the actions were working together so that his faith was complete. So let me tell you this. Grace does not mean to just believe. Grace means I can go. It is the authority. Grace is the license for me to do what God has told me to do. I'm no longer going to be the type of generation that says I'm holy and just being holy. I need to start Doing what the word of God tells me to do. Who here is willing to follow what the word of God says for us to do? To complete your faith. To complete your faith. Now here's something, okay? If we are supposed to complete our faith in, 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 in everything that, that we do, James here is saying this. The important, the important thing is that he's teaching if if I simply say words, but yet don't live it, it's as if I just heard the message and I don't do what it says. It's as if I'm looking on a mirror and when I go, uh, and after looking at the mirror, I forget what I look like. He is saying it's as if you're hearing the word of God, your spirit hears it, but your ear is inattentive to it and your thumb is inattentive to it. Let me tell you this, that the Bible, first of all, is called a mirror. Say mirror. I'm getting somewhere. The Bible is called a mirror and not a window. A mirror and not a window. Because too many of us use the Bible as a window to look at other people's lives. What they're doing and what they're not doing. The Bible is not a window. It's a mirror. So you can look at your own life. Am I holy? Don't look at them. Are they holy? You are set apart. Look in the mirror and begin to say, do I look like what the word of God is saying? It's to work on yourself. I need to hear an amen to that one. Especially for all the judges out there. Mm. It's a mirror. <laughs> all right. So look at this. Philippians 3.7 says the following. Philippians 3.7. It says... But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Can I say that until it hits us, until we receive it and understand it? But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Am I allowed to say that on his Bible? I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. This is, a, this is a, an anointed apostle saying this. God is saying, if you're not willing to let go what I've asked you to let go, you're holding on to garbage. That's a little harsh, Pastor. I didn't say it. Apostle Paul did. What are you holding on to? Because when you hold on to garbage, it begins to stink up in your life. Something smelly. Let go of the garbage. God has something better waiting for you. Say an amen. God has something waiting for you. In comparison, to, so, so what, what does this mean? In, in the, everything you lose for the sake of the gospel, God says you are gaining Christ. Everything you lose, everything your thumb lets go of for the sake of the gospel. I'm not just saying that you decided to just leave people behind. No, for the sake of the gospel and God has revealed to you to let something go and you do it, you gain Christ. And he says, you will not understand. You must value those things as less. You must not look at it as a loss and instead say, I'm gaining something as I lose something. What do I mean by lose? You might lose time. Yes, you might lose friends. You might even lose maybe your own family members respecting you for saying, oh, yeah, you're, you're now one of those Holy Ghost Christians who speak in tongues. It's okay. What you lose, you gain more of Christ. 
You gain more of it. And for the sake of the gospel, what you lose, you gain Christ. But let me tell you this. I'm gonna, I, I want to finish off with this. What does Apostle Paul mean by you gain Christ? I thought I had Christ already when I accepted Jesus, right? Does that make sense? I, when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes in you, right? So what does he mean that I will gain Christ? I want to explain this because it's important. Is that God, I don't know if you've ever heard that song that uh, I don't give myself in pieces. Or sorry, you don't give yourself in pieces. Sorry, I misquoted that one bad. <laughs> You don't give yourself in pieces. That song is something that the Bible teaches, that God doesn't give himself in pieces. When he gave himself to you, he has given himself completely. But the Bible at the same time says I can gain more of him. Why? Because although he's given himself completely to you, you have not given yourself completely to him. To the degree I make room for him is the degree I begin to feel and experience him more. We've been given complete access to the Holy Spirit. But I don't feel filled, Pastor. But I don't feel the anointing. I want more of him. Well, you want more? Then you need to surrender. Let go of some things and you gain more of him in your life. Amen? Although you have all of God... Does God have all of you? You experience more of God to the degree you surrender yourself to God. And let me tell you that if your ear is not surrendered, we cannot experience that realm of God, of experiencing his words. So let me ask you this. We, 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 we haven't even talked about the toe. We'll leave the toe for another day. <laughs> but, the, but we talked just about the ear and the thumb. Hearing, being obedient to the word of God and just believing once again what his word says. And the thumb. God is going to ask you today to reflect on things he's told you to let go of. And let go of it. So you may grasp on things that are better, that is to come. This moment, what, I'm ask, what I would like to ask you guys is if you can help me by faith joining me on your feet. And close your eyes. Close your eyes and I want you to just fall out of love of the need to please everybody else. You will never, ever, ever be a holy generation if you care about other people's thoughts of you, other people's opinions of you, what they say about you. You cannot be a holy generation. Like I said, I've been in a season where I've been accused from different angles and it isn't cool, but that is nothing compared to the persecution of the apostles. Nothing compared, how can I even compare it to the persecution of the primitive church? But it's a start. You might have to go through that type of tribulation of persecution of the words of, of people against your life people beginning to judge you people beginning to look at you and say no now you've gone so crazy you've gone too deep on the deep end you're too spiritual you're too religious if religious means I just read the Bible and believe what it says then I'm religious I don't care Whatever you want to call it, I'm of the other. God is calling you to not be one of the bunch, but to be of the other. A holy generation. He told Abraham, he said, Abraham, walk with me. Be holy as I am holy. What was he talking about? It wasn't just to be sinless. He wasn't saying to Abraham, be perfect because I'm perfect. Because let me tell you something. Abraham would have never been able to accomplish that ask of God. So what did God mean when he said, be holy as I am holy? This is what he meant. Be set apart like I am set apart. Leave your town. Leave your city. Be set apart and obey me. You 
You have to lose your father's household. You will have to lose your wealth. You will have to lose your reputation. You will have to lose it all. But you will gain me in the desert. I can count it all as loss. But give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. He is who I want. I feel like the blood of Jesus right now spiritually, even throughout the preaching, he has been smudging that blood of Jesus on your ear. No longer satisfied with the type of teachings meant for entertainment. No longer satisfied with words that just make you feel happy. I don't claim to have the only sound doctrine out there. But if you choose to go out there and seek another preacher, do not look for those who give appeal to the itching ears. I'm telling you, as you walk out of this place, never again will you be satisfied with regular teaching. You want the meat of the Word of God. You want that thing that changes your life. You want the words that transform you. Thank you so much for listening to one of our sermons here at Atmosphere Church. If you're ever in the area, we would love to have you come over and join us in one of our worship experiences. Also, just a friendly reminder to like, share, and subscribe to our Atmosphere Church YouTube channel. That way you never miss out on one of our live streams or one of our latest sermons. We love you so much and we can't wait to connect with you again.